Hi folks, uh, hope you are doing great and uh, thanks for joining uh, for today's webinar on uh, the future of digital IAM. I'm Prabhas Srivadana from WSO2. Uh, I've been with the company for almost uh, 12 years now and uh, mostly working on the uh, <coughs> open source WSO2 identity server. For those who are new to WSO2 or hear about WSO2 for the first time, it's the uh, number one open source integration vendor. So this is not something uh, uh, we claim by ourselves. Uh, this is how uh, Gartner identified us uh, last year in one of their reports. Also, we are the sixth uh, largest uh, Apache committer globally. So that shows our commitment to open source. And we are the sixth largest open source vendor overall, not just integration, but uh, overall globally across all the domains. We are the sixth largest open source uh, vendor. A uh, quick overview about uh, WSO2 as a company. Uh, so we have more than uh, 550 employees and uh, more than half of them are engineers. So we are a heavily engineering driven organization and everything we do is open source uh, all the products we released are under apache 2.0 open source license uh, so apache 2.0 is the most business friendly uh, open source license out there we have officers in uh, colombo so colombo is our main r d center most of our engineers are located there then we have officers in new york london mountain new sao paulo sydney and our latest office is in uh, <coughs> munich germany and i'm based out of uh, US Mountain New office. And uh, so we have very like uh, uh, positive cash flow and have very healthy year to year uh, growth rate for last uh, few years. And there are more than 500 customers. And over the last 12 years, I got the opportunity, I guess, at least to talk to half of them at, at some, some point in the, in the journey towards digital transformation uh, with us. Last year, like we got a lot of positive, encouraging feedback uh, comments from all leading analysts. So as I mentioned before, uh, Gartner identified us as the number one open source, open core application integration suite vendor. Then Forrester in their Q4 2018 report uh, on Forrester Wave with API management solutions, they identified WSO2 API manager as a leader. And uh, Kapincha Cole, uh, one of the leading uh, <coughs> analysts in the IAM domain based out of Europe, they identified WSO2 identity server. <coughs> sorry, uh, they identified WSO2 identity server as a leader in the Kapincha Cole leadership compounds for access management and federation uh, under the innovation uh, category. And also they identified uh, WSO2 identity server as a leader in the uh, CIAM uh, leadership compass. So very good feedback last year from uh, almost all the leading analysts out there. So here's a like uh, cross section of our customers. Uh, we have like more than uh, 500 customers and you can see it's well spread across uh, different verticals. And uh, most of these customers use more than uh, one W3 product server, uh, server, enterprise integrator, or the API manager. So that's about the companion. Now let's uh, get back to the topic of this webinar. So uh, in, in this session, I'm going to talk about uh, some trends, some patterns we identified working with our customers and looking at the industry and listening to analysts. Uh, what we see would be the future of digital IA. <clears throat> One thing we notice is standards become uh, foundational. It's no more a luxury. Uh, if we go back like a couple of decades back, uh, TCP IP was a luxury. Like, so when you buy something, uh, you look for like uh, the support for TCP IP. And some product vendors, they gain competitive advantage by supporting TCP IP. But today we don't worry about TCP IP stack. It's, it's given that any product out there in the market supports TCP IP and no vendor uh, getting TCP IP like a competitive advantage just by supporting TCP IP. So it's given and everyone should support it. 
So there's a nice talk done by Ian Glaser in one of the uh, European ID conferences uh, on uh, uh, the TCP/IP moment in identity. So he talks about uh, this philosophy and how uh, the standards uh, in identity domain becoming the foundational for all the products and IEM solutions. So no IEM vendor will going to get any competitive advantage by supporting open standards. It's it's given like everyone should support open standards also we see like uh, in last couple of years open id connect based applications getting momentum and more adoption than uh, saml based applications uh, most of our customers i guess more than 90 percent of the customers we worked in 2018 they preferred to go with open id connect or saml and also, if you look at some stats from Azure AD, uh, May 2018, 92% of the 8 billion plus authentication requests Azure AD handled uh, were from uh, OpenID Connect enabled applications. One reason we see this trend is OpenID Connecting Connect is a very like uh, a matured and evolving standard. So it addresses uh, modern enterprise needs, especially uh, in, in securing APIs, securing microservices, securing IoT devices, and it's not just OpenID Connect. So uh, O2O is the foundational standard for OpenID Connect, and there are a lot of other profiles built around that. So it's a larger ecosystem and uh, to, to address the, the modern IAM needs. So O2O is becoming the de facto standard for securing APIs. It's been used and recommended uh, under PST2, it's it's a European uh, regulation uh, for open banking or the financial institutes. So open banking is the the implementation of that UK open banking and other uh, other European states they have their own uh, banking implementations as well. Then FAPI, the financial API, is a set of profile profiles developed uh, under O2O with set of recommendations in securing uh, APIs with O2O. And O2 is also being used for securing uh, microservices. So when it comes to microservices, we worry about security at two levels. One is uh, securing the edge, and the other is securing the service service communication. So to secure the edge, we, we, we usually go ahead with an API gateway, and the API gateway enforces uh, O2 based security. And then from there onwards, you propagate the user context to the microservice deployment using a JWT. So JWT is clearly winning uh, the microservices uh, secret domain. And also uh, we see uh, FIDO2, it's becoming uh, the de facto standard for MFA. Uh, so FIDO uh, with uh, web authentication spec, it went to uh, W3C, but still uh, it's early stages, see whether it's widely adapted or not. Uh, it'll take some time to be mainstream, but it's, it's making a very uh, promising uh, progress. Many enterprises internally, uh, they have started using FIDO, like Google, uh, then uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. So they are using FIDO internally to secure their, their applications. And Google, in fact, uh, made, Google and Facebook both uh, made FIDO an option to uh, uh, secure like Facebook and Google access to the mainstream, but still uh, the adoption rate is very low. And UMA is another promising standard uh, developed under Kantara uh, Foundation and it's moving to the IETF. So WSO2 identity server, we added support for UMA 2 with uh, 5.7 no release. And uh, so we hope uh, this will become mainstream and address some of the critical uh, use cases in, in, in IAM domain, especially like APIs and uh, microservices security, related security uh, stuff. So multi-factor authentication, it is becoming a necessity. So we talked about uh, passwordless authentication for some time, many years, I guess, and tried different approaches, but many of uh, those approaches failed. Uh, uh, one reason is like to get rid of uh, passwordless authentication, we came up with different approaches, like the different uh, second factor authenticators, one issue uh, with all these authenticators is the usability like so it doesn't matter how your two-factor authentication option is secure or like uh, strong if it is not usable it won't get into mainstream 
and also interesting uh, facts here like uh, you can you can reduce account compromise by 99.99% if you just enable mfa but the unfortunate fact is 90% uh, of google users they have not enabled two factor authentication so if you take google uh, they support uh, multiple levels of uh, uh, two factor authentication they do support fido they do support uh, google authenticator app uh, based on totp and also OTP uh, based SMS, but sadly, only 10% of Google users have enabled second factor authentication. So the usability is the main concern uh, to make uh, the, these uh, second factor authentication options mainstream. Then continuous and adaptive authentication. So they can be seen as a next phase of MFA and to some extent they will address the usability concern. So if you use continuous or adaptive authentication, and if you have a strong second factor, you don't need to use that second factor all the time. Uh, so you authenticate the system once with the second factor. Then after that, the system will continuously monitor you and it will prompt uh, for the second factor only if they detect any anomalous behavior. So continuous adaptive authentication will use machine learning and identity intelligence uh, to, to feed in the system to see whether the, the, the level of authentication needs to be elevated or not. Then we also see a strong movement in regulatory standards to mandate the use of uh, strong authentication, second factor authentication, especially under PSD2, uh, the uh, strong customer authentication uh, or the CA specification, it mandates to use a strong uh, uh, second factor authentication on a different assurance, le assurance levels uh, based on uh, the transaction amount you do uh, in your financial transactions. So it is it is being promoted and recommended by uh, by regular standards. WC2 Identity Server added uh, adaptive authentication support since its uh, 570 release uh, last year. So if you are familiar with the Identity Server, you know like before 570, we supported multiple like uh, second factor authentication mechanisms, including FIDO, then TOTP certificate based, uh, then uh, Meeping, uh, Duo Security, likewise. Like so, we support 30 plus authenticators. But then again, uh, uh, the flow is static. Like you can configure multiple authentications by service provider, but you cannot change it based on different contextual parameters. If you won't do that, you have to do some customization. But since 570, uh, we made it very configurable, and you can change uh, the authentication flow based on contextual parameters they can be like uh, environmental parameters or based on user attributes or, or a risk or like you get complete control over the authentication flow and you can simply write a javascript to manip manipulate how you want to authenticate the users so it's basically like well beyond uh, the standard uh, adaptive authentication uh, implementations that you see in most of the products out there some interesting stats from Gartner. So it says by 2022, 60% of large and global enterprises and 90% of MSEs will implement passwordless methods in more than 50% of use cases, which is an increase from fewer than 5% today. So this clearly emphasizes the momentum towards passwordless authentication or to use MFA. So it's a huge shift from uh, 5% uh, to 50%. So that's the emphasis the organizations keep on uh, uh, using MFA. And also uh, Gartner predicts by 2023, vendors that cannot leverage machine learning capabilities for user authentication will lose more than 50% market share among large and global enterprises engaging in digital business. So machine learning, identity intelligence becoming key in, in uh, continuous and adaptive authentication. Every IAM project is also an uh, integration project. So this is uh, another trend we see. Now the enterprises are simply going beyond just having single sign-on and identity federation solutions among their service providers and they look, look to build into an IEM solutions that integrate with uh, access management products, then uh, the, the identity governance and administration uh, products, uh, privilege access management products, SIEM solutions, and uh, the identity intelligence solutions. So they want to build an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, 
identity solution, IAM solution by integrating all these products from different vendors. So system integrators, they have started playing a role here. So it's not just one product. So they are capable of integrating multiple products and build this into an IAM solution. And also it's, it's not just integration between different uh, IAM product, products, but it's also integration between your complete uh, uh, enterprise integration scenarios. So we are facing this exploding endpoint problem. Uh, in next 20 years, uh, less than 20 years, so the world will uh, grow from a billion to more than one trillion programmable endpoints. So we need to worry about securing all these endpoints. These endpoints can be accessed by systems just by being themselves or systems on behalf of uh, human users. So we need to worry about integrating IAM into all these endpoints and see how we can uh, secure them in force access control policies. So APIs, microservices, so integration with the IAM is going to be a very key permanent factor. Open banking and CIAM are good examples of using IAM uh, as a solution. So open banking integrates uh, uh, IAM products, then API management products, uh, machine learning, uh, fraud detection systems to build the open banking solution. CIM is, CIM is also same, like you cannot buy a CIM product from the market, but you can build a CIM solution. So CIM solution includes uh, many products, the IAM products, then IAM products should be able to integrate with your uh, CRM products, uh, marketing automation uh, uh, software, then uh, customer data platforms and uh, mail systems and many other systems, uh, sales, marketing systems, you should be able to integrate and build the CIM solution. So uh, uh, the, the, the objective of a CIM solution is to make the, uh, the customer experience better and through, through that drive better engagements and then maximize uh, the business revenue. So what you see, uh, the end result is the improved user experience, improved customer experience, but, but we see like there are five pillars uh, underneath to make it really happen. So APIs and integration is one ingredient. Then your CIM solution should worry about scalability, strong adaptive authentication, analytics, and then uh, security and privacy. We also see uh, regulatory compliance uh, making uh, uh, into almost all RFIs and RFPs. So all the new product, new new projects, and also existing projects, uh, the the organizations have started worrying about privacy, uh, especially like uh, the momentum uh, the created by GDPR. So GDPR, even though it came from Europe, uh, the impact is uh, global, right? So if you are a global organization, then you need to worry about uh, GDPR, even though your country doesn't have any privacy regulations. And also best thing about GDPR is now not just like uh, not forcing the organizations or the uh, enterprises to be comply with that. Also, this forces other governments and states around the world to come up with their own standards. So the California Consumer Privacy Act and California IoT Privacy Act are two such initiatives like uh, driven by the momentum created by GDPR. So privacy by design and privacy by default are two like uh, uh, is the key philosophy behind all these the privacy regulations. We also see PSD2 and open banking. Uh, PSD2 is a regulation in Europe becoming uh, uh, popular in the financial domain. So both of them started from Europe, but now we see in Canada and Australia they are also uh, following or going in this direction. Once again, by uh, 2020, Gartner predicts more than 75% of entities that intend to manage commerce or technology engagement, including regions, states, and countries worldwide, will have begun to change their privacy regulations to follow the examples of GDPR. So GDPR is real now and its impact is global. We've been talking about uh, microservices for years now, but now we have seen it's it's becoming a reality. We have seen many enterprises uh, moving towards uh, microservices deployments. Anything that will start today, any any uh, services or any integration use cases you build today, 
uh, they they start with a microservices based approach and also we see some people started migrating their uh, monolithic solutions uh, to the uh, microservices uh, domain building uh, services following microservices principles and also uh, we see different maturity levels not everyone uh, strictly following microservices uh, principles uh, they try to do it in in phases also microservices brings in a whole set of new security challenges instead of having just one or two entry points into your deployment now with uh, in a microservices deployment we have hundreds of entry points each of these entry point is is a security risk like right? something that you need to worry about it basically expands our uh, security uh, threat vector so you need to worry about securing all these endpoints so as i mentioned before so in a microservices deployment we need to worry about edge security that's mostly done by a gateway then also we need to worry about uh, uh, service service security like we need to see like how one service authenticates another service and also do authorization and also how do you pass the end user context between microservices one reason microservices uh, like people started talking but not in not not became a reality is like the tooling support to build services uh, to support uh, microservices principles you need to have the right level of tools and now we see that space is measured so we have kubernetes which started as a container orchestration framework now there's a lot of things beyond that then uh, we have docker uh, as a, as a, as a, a container uh, framework and then uh, other other uh, approaches as well so istio is a service mesh uh, implementation which worries about security then uh, resiliency routing control and observability in the microservices deployment istio uh, like uh, it operates in two two planes like control plane and data plane so in control plane there are something called citadel which worries about secret aspect which does uh, certificate distribution and certificate uh, uh, rotation like uh, you can you can ask citadel to assign a, a certificate for each of your workloads or in terms of kubernetes for each each port and it does the rotation as well and also we see spiffy which is an open source standard for uh, securely identifying uh, software systems or workloads so a workload can be a microservice in a dynamic and heterogeneous environments by binding a spiffy id to each workload and it also worries about bootstrapping trust between uh, multiple systems in a platform agnostic manner and also uh, it too does uh, key rotation then we have opa so if you are familiar with sacmel so sacmel uh, for like it has become the de facto standard for access control but it's heavily like uh, xml based and people uh, have started moving away from that so opa address the same space uh, in the microservices domain so it's a policy based uh, control for uh, cloud native environment they have their own programming language called uh, rego so in rego you can quite easily define your access control policies and uh, and enforce that at different levels. Like if it is uh, Istio, so it, Istio has its own uh, access control policies too. But then again, uh, you can uh, at the mixer level in Istio, you can integrate with OPA as well. And also to the your Kubernetes environment, you can use OPA uh, to enforce policies. Uh, so I talked about different maturity levels like most people when they start building a, a microservices deployment they don't worry about uh, securing service service communication they worry about edge security but uh, the security between ser service service uh, communication they take that for granted and they just rely on the network uh, that's not a good approach now uh, we are moving from that threat model to a new threat model called zero trust network so with zero trust network uh, so as the name implies we don't trust the network so when you don't trust the network you need to make sure you enforce policies uh, and security checks as much as closer to your microservice or the resource so in a microservice deployment the resource is a microservice so istio has a uh, tooling for that like so if you use istio in data plane it, it has this envoy proxy so each microservice in a port is fronted by envoy proxy and envoy proxy can enforce security policies as much, much as closer to the uh, 
to the microservice so this is uh, once again an emerging domain domain a lot of things happening and uh, and something to keep uh, track on okay so ho homegrown IAM solutions uh, they are failing to keep up with the pace of innovation so in IAM domain we see a lot of innovation happening in uh, related to standards and also in in the the regulation domain so the uh, the homegrown IAM solutions uh, they need to do a lot of investment uh, to bring it uh, up to a standard then one challenge they face is like uh, most of these homegrown IAM solutions been done like several years back and no one in the companies know about this so because no one knows about it like no one will touch it so because of that they are reluctant to bring in new changes and that uh, in fact block their innovation and also some tend to believe uh the the enterprise level uh, use cases are quite unique by business so they don't think this generic iam products can address that that is true to some extent but not all the time but even even if that is the case what you should do is you should st start with a, a iam product and see how you can extend that product to address your unique business requirements and that what we have seen with <clears throat> most of wso2 customers and when you extend uh, any of these products, you need to be careful. You should not do it in a way that you get locked into those vendors. So then if you get logged in, you cannot move or like, pick a different product and it, it will be like a, a very costly decision if you have to make that. So to, to, to fix that, like to make your business logic decouple from uh, your IAM product, what you need to do is you need to implement your business logic as microservices or services in language any language that you prefer and expose it as an api and you need to write extensions of the product just to that api so you to if you want to throw away that product and get a new one you only need to do change the extension you don't need to touch or change your business logic so you need to be careful uh, when you when you adapt to these standard based products and to extend that to support your business logic and also what we see in organizations who, who, who are planning to move away from these uh, homegrown solutions to standard based uh, uh, products, uh, they, they try to go it in a phased approach. So when you follow a phased approach, you worry about like how to breach these standard based uh, IAM systems uh, applications with this legacy application. So you need to uh, uh, have a product, IAM product, which can which can do that. So all your new applications can support open standards, but still uh, you can keep your old legacy applications and migrate the, those to standard-based approach uh, in phases. So you need to worry about having an IAM solution which can extend and bridge between all the standards and legacy-based ap uh, applications. The blockchain concept uh, has triggered a wave of innovation in identity and access management. It opens a path toward decentralized identity uh, where an entity generates and manages its own identity or I would say identifier. This evolves uh, the federated and mobile identity models to a new level which is uh, more aligned with the privacy by design principles. We have seen an increased number of organizations are deploying limited scale decentralized identity services as uh, POCs, specifically uh, uh, for uh, B2C use cases. And the, the main objective is to learn, evaluate, and increase readiness in preparation for a large scale deployment once a more mature design is available. Also, we see a lot of like open standards are coming up, uh, the decentralized identity, identity fire specification, then zero knowledge protocols, decentralized PKI, decentralized key management. So a lot of uh, standards are coming up to make things interpretable. That, that's key, like we see a lot of blockchain implementations are coming. So interoperability is, is a, a key thing. And we also see uh, these organizations like Decentralized Identity Foundation, Sauron Foundation, then W3C, High Pleasure Indie, which is uh, under the Linux Foundation, are uh, playing a key role in building these uh, uh, standards. So decentralized identity is still at early stage, but it's making uh, a promising uh, progress. Yeah. 
So that's uh, what I plan to cover in this session. And uh, I appreciate if you have any questions so we can uh, discuss and we have more time uh, for a discussion. So please uh, post your questions on your go to meeting chat and uh, I will be able to see it there. Okay, there's a question asking what's WSO2's plan to integrate UMA support. Yeah, so uh, shall I mention that in one of our slides, uh, uh, we already uh, added support for UMA 2.0 uh, from IS570. Uh, no? uh, and we also have plans to see how we can integrate that with our API management uh, product. So then we can build like into a solution. So API manager will act as a resource server, then admin server will act as the, uh, the authorization server. So that's another question asking what's WSO2 plans to support blockchain based identities. OK, so this is once again another area uh, we are working on still at the POC level. Uh, uh, actually, I did a web, complete webinar on this uh, sometime back with uh, Veridium ID. Uh, so our our approach is to see how we can uh, bridge the standard based approaches like SAML, OpenID Connect with blockchain based identities. So you deploy identity server as IDP. It knows how to uh, how to fetch your uh, or how to find your blockchain based identity based on a given uh, decentralized identifier or DID. Then it will build a SAML open ID connect token and pass that back to the application. So applications uh, service providers, they don't need to worry about uh, worry about uh, blockchain based identities. They, they can still uh, uh, work with uh, the standard based approach and identity server will uh, do the bridging. So that's something uh, uh, we are working on. Okay, there's another question. What is your take on Mobile Connect? Okay, so uh, yeah. Uh, so those who hear about Mobile Connect for the first time, uh, Mobile Connect is an open standard uh, built on top of OpenID Connect. Uh, mostly promoted by uh, GSMA and WSO2 is one of the uh, very first organizations to support uh, mobile connect the identity server supports uh, mobile connect in in two aspects so one is you can deploy uh, identity server in uh, in, in your uh, 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 MNO side mobile network operator side who access IDP to support mobile connect uh, uh, protocol and the other service providers can use uh, that to let the users log into applications with mobile connect so we have large scale deployment in india so mobile connect is not very popular globally but it's getting traction in asia pacific and also in europe so in india we have uh, deployed identity server uh, with uh, the, the top six mobile network operators there and it's available for 900, 900 million uh, 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 people in India, but then again, uh, in reality, what we have seen is around 20 million people using it. The reason is, uh, even though it's available for all uh, the subscribers of those six MNOs, there are only a few uh, service providers. So the challenge is how to onboard service providers to support uh, a mobile connect. And to address that tax aspect, we also build a federated authenticator to support mobile connect. That means uh, if you have a service provide an application, let it be a web app or a mobile application, which support any any federation protocols, OpenID Connect or SAML. You don't need to change anything. You simply uh, do uh, 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 authentication with the identity server, then identity server will uh, do the brokering and uh, will uh, authenticate the user against the, uh, the, the uh, mobile network operator using the mobile connect uh, protocol so with that approach you 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 need you need not to do any code changes at your service providers
And there's another question how and when will decentralized IAM be supported by WSO2? I guess uh, uh, I answered that question already. Okay, so if you're asking for the timeline, uh, so we are working with one customer uh, to add this support. Uh, so probably it'll take a couple of quarters to uh, make it mainstream. Because it's, one, as I said, it's still early stage. Even the organizations who are working on decentralized identity, they do it at the experimental level. So it'll take some time to uh, be mainstream. Okay, there's another question uh, based on your explanation. Is there a best practice blueprint authentication flow for cloud-based environment? So uh, is it always an individual solution uh, for company? Yeah. So that will depend on uh, various factors. Uh, so uh, uh, I like, don't think there'll be a blueprint because it's uh, it's based on uh, based on the type of users, the audience of your system. But uh, in, in, in any case, you need to worry about uh, uh, multi-factor authentication. So when you have multi-factor authentication there, what you need to worry about is uh, uh, which factor you pick, right? So it can be FIDO, it can be uh, SMS OTP, which is not, not, not recommended, but once again, due to the usability concerns, SMS OTP is still the popular choice, but still it's not recommended due to security, security reasons. So if you don't use SMS OTP, then GOT, uh, the, the Google Authenticator, which is supported, uh, which supports the TOTP standard, it's a good choice because uh, if it is SMS, then you need to have the mobile connectivity. But if it is uh, Google Authenticator based on TOTP, you don't need to be online uh, uh, or connected to your mobile network operators to authenticate. So yes, so uh, you need to worry about like several factors when you build a, a, a blueprint for your cloud-based authentication. Yeah, so there's another question for decentralized IAM. How does WSO2 intend to contribute to this? I guess uh, I, I already answered that question. Yeah, so there's another question. Is it uh, possible I mixed two sources from users to one only? aim and provide metadata to omnichannel example zip code exists in uh, source database a and name age is in source b my app android access one only aim and request mode. okay yeah so to do that yeah so we have multiple options so one is in the uh, login flow uh, so I mentioned you like from identity server 570 onwards, you get complete control uh, over the login flow and you can connect to multiple data sources. You can extend that right in JavaScript. And if, if the current JavaScript functions are not enough to address this particular use case, then you can extend the product to talk to multiple sources and fetch different attributes and fetch that to the, uh, the identity server, the policy decision point. And based on that, you can uh, decide the flow. And if you have more information on that, like please send me a mail to uh, uh, prabhat at wso2.com for a uh, follow-up discussion. Okay, so I guess that's uh, all we have. Uh, okay, so then uh, thank you very much for joining and we'll share uh, the slides and the recording of the video. So we'll send you a mail. Uh, thanks again. Thank you very much for joining.